So far, we've only talked about systems in one dimension and studied bifurcations and critical slowing down for dynamical systems in which the state is only given by one variable. So today we're going to be talking about what happens when we move into two dimensions because the stability around fixed points becomes a lot more complicated and then we'll see that we get different kinds of bifurcations. But then once we've studied those bifurcations, you'll see that even in two dimensions, this phenomenon of critical slowing down can still be seen. So let's make sure everything is rigorously defined. In two dimensions, a dynamical system has to be given by a rate of change of the state and then that's given by a function of the state. So here we're using two variables, x and y, and then the rate of change of both the x and the y variable is each given by a different function of the state, x and y. So the state of the system is given by two variables, x and y, obviously in R2. Now I could alternatively write this rather than as a vector with two components, I could just write in vector notation x as a vector dot, which is the rate of change over time, so dx by dt is equal to some vector function of the state. So this rate of change function is itself a vector field. So as every value of the state, so every value of x and y, if we go to that point, then we'll give a, be given a vector which represents the rate of change of those variables at that point. So if we go to zero and the value of the vector field there is a big vector that stretches out to infinity, then that means that we're going to diverge from that point very quickly. So what we can do is we can plot this vector field, which represents the rate of change at any point on a diagram in two dimensions. This is called the phase space. The phase space is just the uh, coordinate system that we're using. So we'll plot X and Y and then we will plot this vector field given by the function on that diagram. And then you can see from the diagram what's going to happen around the fixed points. So then we'll start studying the maths and actually work out how we can predict what those fixed points are going to look like. So in this case, if we draw the phase diagram of some function, we might find that it looks like a spiral. So if you were to start somewhere near zero, so your x coordinate could be say 0.1 and your y coordinate could be 0.1, putting x and y on the axes, then you get given a vector which represents your rate of change. So these are the vectors that we draw on the diagram with the arrows pointing in the positive time direction. So you, if you start there, then the vector field representing the rate of change of this system will cause you on this diagram to spiral out. So it's a good way of representing geometrically what's going to happen for the coordinates of a dynamical system given any function. Then if you want to work out the fixed point of your two-dimensional system, then that's obviously going to be where the rate of change given by this function is just equal to zero for both coordinates. So if you want to try and work out where these fixed points are going to be, then you just need to solve the equation for f of x vectors is equal to zero. Then what we can do is we can study this function to try and work out what the vector field looks like around that point. And then we can classify the fixed points into different categories based on what the vector field around that point looks like. So this would be a, an unstable spiral because if you start slightly away from this fixed point here, you will move away in a spiral shape. You could have a stable spiral where it goes the other way around or the vector field causes you to move towards the fixed point or the center of the spiral over time. So we're going to start seeing what that will look like if we try to solve this system. Now, I'm gonna teach this in the same way that it would usually be taught in a lecture course, which means that I will be missing out lots of proofs of some facts from linear algebra, which I think are quite important that you see that they can be proved. I don't like to just take something as being true without a proof. So I'm going to use the facts as will be traditionally done in this video. And then at some point I'll include an appendix to explain the proofs of some of these facts. They're mostly things to do with, say, what uh, entries in a matrix add up to in terms of eigenvalues. So that raises the question, why are we dealing with matrices then? So 
if we have a dynamical system in two dimensions, the most simple kind of system that you can have that's non-trivial is a linear system. So that would be one where the function is just linear. which could be represented by a matrix. Basically, this means that in the functions, both x and y have to be of first order. If you were to write it out, you would get that x dot y dot is equal to ax plus by cx plus dy. So that's why we call it linear, because both of the functions for the rate of change of each coordinate are only to first order in x and y. So then if we were to try and solve this for a fixed point, you would be finding where that's equal to 0, 0. Now, to study these systems, we are going to try and work out where the straight line solutions would be. There might not be any straight line solutions, but if there are, where would they be? And then we will see that at 0, 0, the place where those straight line solutions intersect is the fixed point, and then studying the behaviour of those straight line solutions will tell us what kind of fixed point it is. Writing this in shorthand vector notation, you just get x is a vector dot, or rate of change of a vector representing the state is given by a matrix, so we'll call this matrix A times by the state vector. Now, this state vector has to be a function of time. So if we're looking for a straight line solution, then that's going to be given by x as a function of time is equal to some vector representing that straight line times a function of just t, which will tell us how far along that straight line we are with respect to time. You can quite easily work out what this function of time has to look like. If you differentiate this, then you will get the rate of change function is just the derivative of this function times the vector again. And we've said that these are straight line solutions, so the derivative is just going to be some proportion of the original function. If I write that out explicitly, I can say f of t times v is going to be equal to some constant which I'll call a times the derivative. That mean that that just ensures that um, it will stay a straight line once we've differentiated it, and that in particular the same straight line. It has to be a scalar multiple of the same vector. Now, if you cancel those vectors out, then you've then got a nice differential equation which you can solve. F of t is equal to a times df by dt. So doing some rearranging and integrating, you get that the integral of dt is equal to a over f of t, df of t. You integrate that and then solve that and you get t is equal to uh, a times the natural log, which I'll call lun, of f of t. And then there may be some constant in there, which I will call dot plus c on the end. Now, if you rearrange this equation here, it becomes very simple. You do minus c and then divide by a. Now, I'm going to call 1 over a lambda just for convenience. You'll see why in a minute. So if I do minus c divided by a, I'll get some other constant. So it'll be um, lambda, which is 1 over a times t plus some constant is equal to ln f of t. If you just raise both sides of an exponent with e as the base, then you'll get some constant k that comes out as a constant in the front. So a times e to the lambda t is the function. But because I'm just setting this function kind of arbitrarily, I can ignore the a because having some constant there isn't going to change the behavior of the function over time. That's just going to change sort of um, the magnitude of those vectors. So like the magnitude of the rate of change at any given time will be 
proportional to this constant a but if we're just studying the behavior of the system that doesn't really make any difference now the really important thing that we want to find in this straight line solution is what lambda is specifically is it positive or negative because that will tell us whether these straight line solutions are going to decay or grow exponentially over time so it'll kind of tell us are over time are we going to get are we going to move along the straight line out to infinity or are we going to return to zero if that's positive then over time this grows exponentially and you'll head off to infinity if it's negative then this will decay exponentially to zero and if you put in t is infinity or something large then you'll end up getting zero or zero zero vector out of here so you will decay back to zero which is the fixed point so we want to come up with a way of finding lambda now this turns out to be quite a simple linear algebra problem because if we differentiate this then you will find that we get x dot is equal to lambda e to the lambda t sorry i've not drawn that very well times the vector and that has to be equal to a which is this matrix times x of t so that's equal to a e to the lambda t times v then if we cancel the e to the lambda term on both of these we'll get left with the eigenvalue equation a v is equal to lambda v and if you rearrange that you'll get a minus lambda times the identity times vector v is equal to zero now that's obviously just the eigenvalue equation so that tells us that we can use this matrix A, the linear function representing the rate of change, to find the values of lambda by the usual eigenvalue method. Now the way that you do that is using the fact that this equation implies that this whole matrix here, which looks like A minus lambda B C D minus lambda has to have determinant zero. So rearranging that eigenvalue problem, you multiply the diagonal and take off the other diagonal. So that's this line. And then I've just expanded everything out and rearranged to get a quadratic equation in terms of lambda. Now that you'll notice a couple of interesting things here. A plus D in terms of the original matrix A which was A, B, C, D. A plus D is just the trace of A. And A, D minus B, C is the determinant of A. So I'm going to use those substitutions in the quadratic equation, which we'll try and solve. We write for simplicity, tau is the trace of A and delta is the determinant of A. So that then gives us a nice simple quadratic equation, lambda squared minus tau lambda plus delta is equal to zero. And putting that in the quadratic formula, which you should know is lambda is going to be tau plus or minus square root of tau squared minus four delta over two. So then the characteristics of tau and delta will tell us whether or not these two values of lambda that we can find are going to be positive or negative, or if there's going to be some other interesting things going on. Now, an important thing to note is this suggests that there's going to be two solutions to lambda. So there are two straight line solutions, both of which go through zero, zero in this linear system. So we're going to go ahead now and try and work out what this formula tells us about the conditions for which lambda will be positive or negative or sometimes complex, and then what those kind of fixed points are going to look like. In order to solve these problems, which will tell us the conditions tau and delta or the trace and the determinant of that matrix A, the linear function, and what that implies about the eigenvalues. 
there's a couple of facts that we need to know, first of all. I'm not going to prove these in this video. Hopefully I'll prove them in a video another time. I think at the moment I don't really have time to prove them, so I'll put an appendix in with them in. But specifically, the facts that we need to know are, for the two eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda 2, then we have certain properties about the matrix. Remember that these are the eigenvalues for the matrix A, so the sum of the two eigenvalues is equal to the trace of the matrix and the product of the two eigenvalues is equal to the determinant of the matrix. And we can then use those with this quadratic equation to work out what lambda will look like given different conditions. Now the first case that we will study is the case where the determinant of the matrix is negative. Now th that implies that we have to have one positive and one negative eigenvalue because the determinant is just the product of the two. So the only way to get a negative value for the determinant is to have one positive and one negative eigenvalue. If I then substitute the fact that delta is less than zero into here, then you can see that tau squared minus four delta is always going to be positive. So if one of the eigenvalues has to be positive and one of the eigenvalues has to be negative, then that means that along one of the eigenvector directions, say if lambda is the negative eigenvalue, then the straight line solutions along that line have to decay back to zero, the fixed point. And then along the other eigenvalue, eigenvector direction, lambda 2 must be positive in order to have one positive and one negative eigenvalue. So if lambda 2 is positive, the straight line solutions exponentially grow along this line and will shoot out to infinity. So we get this diagram that looks like this, where along one direction we're converging to the fixed point, and along the other direction we're diverging from the fixed point. Another thing which I'm going to tell you without proving is that around these straight line solutions, the non-linear solutions kind of match it. So if you were to start over here, you would follow along this line and then move away like that. And then the same there and the same there. So you get this property of the fixed point where if you come in along one direction or if you start kind of close to one particular eigenvector direction, you will move towards the center and then away along the other direction. That's why it gets called a saddle point because it's kind of like a saddle point in calculus where it, you're moving in along one direction and out along the other direction rather than a saddle point in calculus is the derivative is negative along one direction and positive along the other direction. But I guess that just corresponds to the fact that you've got one positive and one negative eigenvector, eigenvalue, sorry. So that's called a saddle point. The second case that we're going to consider is when the two eigenvalues are either both positive or both negative. Now, if lambda 1 and lambda 2 are both of the same sign, then that means that the determinant has to be greater than 0. For case 2a, we're going to specifically take the property that tau squared minus 4 delta is still greater than 0, so we're still getting two real eigenvalues out. And then for case 2b, we will study the situation where that's negative. So 2a, this has to be positive. And lambda 1 and lambda 2 were of the same sign. So either lambda 1 is greater than 0, lambda 2 is greater than 0 or lambda 1 is less than 0, lambda 2 is less than 0. Now obviously that means that along the two eigenvector directions we're either going to have exponential growth along both or exponential decay along both. 
So if I draw the diagrams of those, I will get uh, it's kind of star shape, and this one will be unstable because that's the exponential growth. This one will be stable. Drawing the diagram, we get the two different straight line directions, which are eigenvector solutions to the eigenvector equation we looked at. Then if both lambda 1 and lambda 2 are positive, then that means we have exponential growth of vectors along both of them. So if we were to start with a vector that looks like that, then over time the magnitude of that vector has to move outwards. So we will move away along this line and along this line as well from the centre. Now if we then extend this, which I'm not going to prove, to vectors which aren't along those straight lines, we can either have a star where all of them point out, or we can have this strange node shape where the lines kind of follow each of the straight line solutions like that. I probably haven't drawn that very well. Try and draw it better when we do the stable nodes. So here we're exponentially decaying along both directions. Because both of the eigenvalues are negative, the solutions have to decay to zero, the fixed point over time. And then if you get this node shape where the other lines kind of follow the same shape. Another possibility is that you just have a star where all of the lines are straight line solutions that go to zero like that. And you can have either a stable or an unstable star. Those are just two different possibilities that you can get. And you may well have to do a bit more work than just finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors to work out whether or not you'll get a star and whether or not you'll get a node like that. And I'm going to move on to the next case because that's not really within the scope of this video. Case 2b kind of follows on logically from the last one. What now if tau squared minus 4 delta is less than 0? Well then the eigenvalues that we're going to get are going to be complex. You'll have tau over 2 plus or minus some complex number. So I'm going to call that omega. And I'm going to call tau over 2 k. Now I'm not going to prove this fact as well, but basically this means that k is kind of the um, radial rate of change. And then omega is the angular frequency that we rotate around the fixed point. So obviously that's going to give us a spiral shape because we're moving outwards from the fixed point and around as well. Two situations that we can get are an unstable or a stable spiral. As we said, k is kind of the radial rate of change or rate of growth or decay. So if k is positive, then the vectors are going to be moving away from the center. k is negative, the vectors have to move towards the center. So that gives us either a stable or an unstable spiral. And then omega is just the angular frequency at which these vectors are rotating around the fixed point of the center. Now the last case kind of follows on from this again. The previous cases that we've discussed had lambda being positive or negative or possibly complex with a real and an imaginary part. What happens then if we only have an imaginary part? So in order to only have an imaginary part, tau has to be zero and delta has to be greater than zero. That will leave us with just the negative bit inside the square root giving us an imaginary solution. So then the solutions for lambda that we will get are plus or minus the square root of minus 4 delta over 2. That's just equal to plus or minus i times the square root of delta, which I will call omega. And again, just like we saw in the spirals, omega represents an angular frequency around the center. But we don't have a radial 
component. So we can't be moving inwards or outwards. So the diagram that we get ends up looking like uh, the solutions around the center just rotate round in circles. The final case, which I'll only mention very briefly, is what happens if delta, the determinant of the linear system, is zero. Well, then we just get that lambda is either equal to zero, because those two terms would cancel out, or it's equal to tau. Now, that means that we will get an eigenvector that corresponds to the eigenvalue lambda equals tau, so we'll have one direction where we're either stable or unstable. You'll either exponentially grow or decay along that direction. But then all other directions um, would be a linear combination of the two vectors which we get. But with the eigenvalue of zero, we will find that along the other direction, which will be the eigenvector solving lambda equals zero, we don't grow or decay at all. So along the lambda equals zero eigenvector direction, all of the points along there aren't going to change. So we get a line of fixed points. Now that we've considered a number of different cases for what the fixed point can look like, we can draw a nice diagram, which you'll see in a minute that just helps us to visualize all of these different types of fixed points that we get. The point of this video is just to go over the classifications. I'm not going to go into too much detail of all of the proofs at the moment because in order to study bifurcations with these fixed points, we just need to be able to classify them. We found five different cases. Now these cases all rely simply on whether or not things like tau and delta are negative, positive, zero, or whether they're bigger or smaller than tau squared minus four delta. So if I plot delta against tau, then I can draw on the line, which will be a parabola, tau squared minus four delta. And then on this plane, I can now place where each of the different fixed points will be. So for the saddle points, delta had to be less than zero, and that was the only condition. So over here, we're going to have just saddle points. Then the straight line solutions, where we have a line with fixed points along it, are for delta is equal to zero. So along this line is where we're going to have a line of fixed points. The centers case three were for when ta tau is equal to zero. So they just lie along this line, tau equals zero. Then the cases 2a and 2b, both of them rely on whether or not tau is going to be positive or negative. And we have this property that the trace is just equal to the sum of the two eigenvalues. Both of these relied on the two eigenvalues having the same sign, at least for the real part. So if they have the same sign, then either these are both positive or both negative. So tau will either be positive or negative. And then if they were both positive, that was an unstable solution. And if they were both negative, that was a stable solution. So all of the stable ones are going to be for tau is negative, so that's down here, and all of the unstable ones will be for tau is positive. Then which side of this line tau squared minus four delta will they be on? Well, tau squared minus four delta is greater than zero, is the same as saying that tau squared is bigger than four delta. So we're looking for where tau is big up here. So that's where we will get uh, the nodes, so that it could look like a star or it could look like a kind of strange shape. Specifically, the stars occur along the line. I'm not going to prove that either. 
the strange node shapes that we had that looked kind of curvy will occur away from the line and then on the line that's where we will get the star shapes. Where we decay in a straight line along any direction. So this is going to be the unstable nodes, then unstable stars along the line, and then when tau squared minus 4 delta is less than 0, that's when tau squared is less than 4 delta. So here we're going to get the unstable spirals that will look a lot like that big diagram that I drew at the start, where we move out in a spiral along any direction. And then here we will get the stable spirals. And then along this line, we get the stable stars and then stable nodes outside. I'm sorry that in this video, I didn't include as much proofs as would have been useful to understand everything. They don't generally prove all of the facts that I've used in a more applied course about dynamical systems in two dimensions, so I haven't included them. I would like to prove them at another date, but I'm not doing that today because I want to get on with uh, studying real examples of systems. The point to get from this video is that there are different classifications of fixed points in two dimensions, and you can draw this diagram called a stability diagram or a Prankery diagram that just really easily helps you remember what the solutions will look like given the different values of the trace and determinant of the matrix A. Now, we've only studied so far linear systems. So the question is, can you do a similar thing for nonlinear systems? You can, and the way that you do it is by turning a nonlinear system into a linearization plus some higher order terms. So suppose we're working with some two-dimensional system that isn't linear. We want to linearize it around the fixed points to then use that diagram that we saw earlier to classify them. So to start with, we need to find where those fixed points are. So that's where this is equal to 0, 0. And I'm going to call the fixed points that we will find x star, y star. There could be any number of fixed points for different two-dimensional systems. So what I'm then going to do is linearize the solutions x of t, y of t around this fixed point. So I'm going to write u of t, v of t is equal to x of t, y of t minus x star, y star. So u and v are just like the bits that we have remaining around the fixed point along each axis. Now I'm going to use the Taylor series in two dimensions to expand this around these fixed points. So that would be writing that x of t is now uh, u of t plus the fixed point, and y of t is now v of t plus the fixed point. We've written the vector function in terms of these substitutions, x is u plus x star, y is v plus y star. So we can then do a Taylor expansion of each of those functions about the fixed point x star, y star. Now I'm not going to prove the Taylor series in two dimensions because it's pretty standard, but you can have a look at it if you want to online. I'll get f of u plus x star, v plus y star is equal to f of the point that we're expanding about, x star, y star, plus u df by dx of x star, plus v df by dy of y star, plus some higher order terms. Now, that's the function of the fixed point, so that has to be zero. So we'll get left with this nice function in terms of u and v and some derivatives plus higher order terms. 
Now we can do the same thing for G. And again, we will get G of X star Y star, which is just equal to zero. And then plus, this time we get U D G by DX. With X star plus V DG by DY y star plus again some higher order terms so that allows us to write f and g as a matrix so writing it as a matrix of all of these derivatives you can see that multiplying out this matrix with the vector uv will give us those taylor expansions that we saw for f and g about the fixed point plus a load of higher order terms now because x of t is just equal to uh, it was u plus x star and y of t is equal to v plus y star. Then if you want to take the derivatives, you'll get that x dot is just equal to u dot, and that's a constant, so it cancels. y dot is equal to v dot, and the constant cancels. So x dot y dot is just the same as u dot v dot. So that's the variables u and v, which represent the expansion around the fixed point. Now that, again, gives us just a new dynamical system in terms of u and v with this matrix, just like the linear systems that we saw earlier, and then some higher order terms. So by studying this matrix of derivatives, you can do the same things that we did earlier, working out the determinant and the trace of the matrix, and from that, classify all the different fixed points. The important question now is, what about the higher order terms? Do they affect the classification of the matrix? Well, they only affect the classification of the matrix if it was along one of those border lines that we saw earlier. If it was, say, a center, then you would need to study the higher order terms in order to work out whether it was really a center or if it was actually a spiral. But if we get from the linearization that the fixed point is a spiral or an, a node or a saddle point, then it doesn't matter what the higher order terms will be because they don't really distort it enough to make any difference. The higher order terms will all be in terms of u squared and v squared or uv or u cubed or something like that. And because u and v are small because we're expanding around the fixed point, then the higher order terms have to be very small. So um, the higher order terms only affect the classification of the fixed points given a linearization if we're on one of those borderline cases. Just to explain that with the diagram, if we do the linearization, get that matrix of derivatives and study the determinant and trace of that matrix, then if we find ourselves in one of these regions, then the linearization is correct. If we find ourselves along a borderline where we've got something like a center or you would get a star that's either stable or unstable along this line. And you would need to check with the higher order terms whether or not it really is a star or a center, whether it's actually a node or a spiral instead. That's my overview then of uh, the stability of fixed points in two dimensions. The next thing that we're going to study is what bifurcations look like in two dimensions, so we'll do that in the next video. I hope that this has given you a good overview. I don't think that it will make sense the first time you watch me explain it if you've never seen it before. So you might want to watch a couple more videos on this. Again, I will try and put more proof in at another time, but I don't think I really have time to do that at the moment. So I'll see you next time for bifurcations in two dimensions.